Greetings, folks. Today is Saturday, March 9th, 2019. I'm Tom Lineweaver, and this is my commentary, and it's going to be rather lengthy today, just to warn you. Because I finally found a way to merge what I'm saying with what other people are saying. All right? So, uh, this first clip is of Tucker Carlson on Fox News with his guest, Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz is a Jew, and he's also supposed to be a constitutional attorney. But uh, you go ahead and listen to what he had to say. Congresswoman Ilan Omar sparking bipartisan backlash again for anti-Semitic comments, this time igniting a Twitter feud over the weekend with fellow Democrat from New York, Nita Lowy, after suggesting U.S. politicians were being forced to, quote, pledge allegiance to Israel. Congresswoman Lowy firing back Sunday, tweeting, I believe we can debate important policy without using offensive painful stereotypes. This latest feud comes less than a month after Omar was called out for writing, quote, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, suggesting lawmakers are bribed to support the country of Israel. Here to weigh in is Harvard Law School emeritus professor and author of The Case Against Impeaching Trump, Alan Dershowitz. Alan, good morning to you. Good morning. Um, what's going on here? Well, she is very anti-American. Put aside the anti-Israel. She's so anti-American. She accuses American members of Congress, men and women, Jewish, Christian. Um, she accuses them, essentially, of doing it for the money. We know that Americans overwhelmingly support Israel because Israel is a democracy. It's America's strongest ally in the Middle East. It's the only country in the Middle East that America can always count on. You never know who's going to be the head of Egypt next month. Right. You never know what's going to happen in other countries. But you know that no matter who's elected in Israel, they're going to be very supportive of America. They're going to exchange intelligence information, military information. And her attack on supporters of Israel is an attack on America. And she accuses them of dual loyalty. Well, she supports Hamas. She supports other terrorist groups that are anti-American, uh, if, if supporters of Israel are guilty of due loyalty, which they're not, what about supporters of, uh, of, of America's enemies? Uh, so, you know, her arguments are absurd. They're down at, at bottom. They're anti-American. And, of course, they're, they're anti-Israel, which is America's strongest ally. And I think the response in Congress has been appropriate to condemn her right. and to marginalize her. And to make sure people understand, she didn't run on this platform. This is a bait and switch. She's gotten in Congress now, and she's taken on herself to present the strongest anti-Israel case in modern history that any member of Congress has ever tried to present. And she's being rebuffed, except by the radicals in the Democratic mm -hmm. Party who are jumping to her support. Some well, of them just on free speech grounds, but others on the merits. Well, she has gone back and forth with members of Congress from her own party over the last uh, 72 hours. Uh, and in fact, there's a tweet from, I believe, yesterday where she tripled down on some of her comments. She said, our democracy is built on debate, Congressman. Here she is referring to Le Nita Lowy of New York. I should not have been expected to have allegiance, pledge support to a foreign country in order to serve my country in Congress or serve on committee. The people of the fifth elected me to serve their interest. I am sure we agree on that. Do you think that Nita Lowy is going to agree with her on that? No, nobody has to take a pledge of intra of any kind of pledge to serve in Congress in the United States. But she told her constituents when she ran that she would support America, and she is not. Mm -hmm. She is supporting America's uh, enemies and undercutting uh, American uh, values. You know, the fact that she supports enemies of America and doesn't look herself in the mirror and say, my God, if I'm accusing people of dual loyalty, where are my loyalties? Are my loyalties to America or are my loyalties to the Palestinian Authority, to Hamas, to Hezbollah? I'm not accusing her of dual loyalty. She has the right to express support for enemies of America. That's part of her 
a role as a free person in Congress. But for her to accuse Jewish members of Congress and non-Jewish members of Congress right. of dual loyalty because they support America's allies, would you, would you accuse somebody of dual mm -hmm. loyalty if they supported England, if they supported France and other American allies? It's the worst canard. And it's, right. it really goes back to some of the anti-Semitic tropes of the early 20th century and late 19th century, and she ought to be ashamed of herself. And the Democrats must marginalize her and distance her from the center of the party. And I hope she'll be primaried. And she should be beaten in a primary by people who support the United States and people who support American allies rather than people who support America's enemies. Well, let's see what happens. Um, Alan Dershowitz joining us from Miami. Sir, thank you very much for the point of view. Thank you. Uh, sorry, that clip was from Fox News, uh, not Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is doing this clip. This week, the U.S. political world has been grappling with where the line is between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. Freshman Democratic Representative Ilhan Omar has now apologized for tweets suggesting that members of Congress support Israel because they are being paid to do so. But Omar has not backed away from criticizing the lobbying organization known as APAC, or the American Israel Political Action Committee. And President Trump, who has spoken at the annual APAC conference today, lashed out at the Congresswoman. What she said is so deep-seated in her heart that her lame apology, and that's what it was, it was lame, and she didn't mean a word of it, uh, was just not appropriate. I think she should resign from Congress. Not appropriate. This is the same President Trump who said the white supremacists who marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, included some very fine people. Never mind, Mr. Trump. Let's examine the Israel lobbying effort in spotlight. And for that, we bring in Omar Badar, Deputy Director of the Arab American Institute. And Omar, what are the main problems as you see them with APAC? Well, look, APAC is one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in Washington by the acknowledgement of many members of Congress and even by the bragging of APAC officials themselves. Jeffrey Goldberg, who is perhaps the leading pro-Israel journalist in the U.S., who's now uh, the editor of The Atlantic, he recalled a story where he sat with a high-ranking uh, official in APAC who handed him a napkin in a restaurant and said, within 24 hours, APAC can have 70 senators have this napkin signed for you. I mean, that's the kind of influence that we're talking about. And like, you know, the, APAC is just one of many powerful lobbying organizations in the U.S., whether it's the NRA, whether it's the fossil fuel industry, or whether it's sort of the health insurance, medical insurance industry. These are all lobbies that influence politics with money. And the idea that the Israel lobby is somehow an exception to, you know, money and politics is, is just completely preposterous. They're just another lobby that behaves in the same direction. And like many of these lobbies, once they have, once they grow to become this powerful, they sometimes start pushing for policies that are counterproductive, that are not basically in the best interest of U.S. citizens or for the issues that they're advocating on. And in the case of AIPAC, obviously they're pushing for a carte blanche for Israel to behave as it wants with the Palestinians and imposing all these abuses on them without accountability. And at home, they're behaving in ways that undermine the First Amendment rights of American citizens by pushing these bills that try to criminalize basically criticism of Israel through the form of boycotts. And th this, is, this is really the primary problem with AIPAC. And to be clear, I mean, AIPAC represents a number of conservatives. In their views of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there is a more progressive view of the conflict that is represented by J Street. But regarding uh, AIPAC, you mentioned uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. Over the past decade, there has been criticism of AIPAC from Israel supporters, including Tom Friedman, uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, J.J. Goldberg. Um, but conservatives are calling Ilhan Omar an anti-Semite for her criticism of AIPAC. APAC. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. So, look, I think, you know, let's be clear about the fact that all of this backlash is not about concern about bigotry. There's no question about that. I mean, you played that clip of, of President Trump talking about, you know, you know, you mentioned actually that, you know, he talked about very fine people in Charlottesville who are white supremacists. But that's not all. I mean, he also campaigned in a very anti-Semitic way when he was running for president. One of the examples is when he met with the, with the Jewish, uh, with the Republican Jewish coalition. He actually told them, I don't think I'm going to get your support because you like to control politicians and I don't need your money. I cannot think of any more sort of like stereotypically 
racist and anti-Semitic depiction than, than the one that the president engaged in. And when Thomas Friedman in The New York Times talks about how the Israel lobby had bought and paid for a standing ovation in, among members of Congress uh, for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, nobody bats an eye about that. And the reason is because the president is sort of this kooky right-winger, and Tom Friedman is, is a centrist pro-Israel voice. And they don't see them as a threat to the pro-Israel consensus in American policy. The so, same in other way words, if you're, a supporter, this sort of, if you're a supporter of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, then you can criticize AIPAC and you get away with it. But if you're not a supporter of Israel and you also criticize AIPAC, and oh, by the way, you happen to be Muslim, then somehow you're anti-Semitic? I mean, is it, is it as simple as saying this is yeah. Islamophobia? They, so Islamophobia is absolutely a part of it, but it's not just that. It's Islamophobia. They see these people, you know, they see members like Rashida Tlaib and, and Ilhan Omar as vulnerable because of the climate of Islamophobia. But ultimately, their crime is pushing for a progressive change in American policy to change, basically, this consensus on American-Israeli relations and calling for a more even-handed approach and accountability. And the efforts by a lot of these people who are now smearing them, it's really an effort to smear and intimidate and silence anybody who's trying to meaningfully change American policy on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Does it also diminish historical significance when you have some conservatives who will suggest that uh, Ilhan Omar is somehow like Hitler, as I saw conservative do last night? I mean, that seems to diminish the actual significance of what Hitler did in order to score some political points. Absolutely. And it's incredibly contemptible and distasteful. I mean, look, anti-Semitism is a real problem in the United States and a growing one. And to trivialize it by throwing it around at critics of Israeli policy or the Israel lobby is, is absolutely not doing favors to anybody who cares about genuine anti-Semitism. This is really just reprehensible political. You know, yeah, they've turned a real meaningful issue of bigotry and something that we should all unite about defeating, which is anti the growing problem of anti-Semitism. They've turned that into political football to score political points. And it really is reprehensible. Omar Badar, Deputy Director of the Arab American Institute. And Omar, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now we have Ben Swan doing a re uh, a reality. <laughs> a reality check. Take it away, Ben. Leading House Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi, plan to offer a resolution today condemning anti-Semitism in response to Congresswoman Ihan Omar's latest remarks on Israel. Now, House Republicans and others, they want Pelosi to go even further and for Omar to be removed from the House Foreign Relations Committee, all because she questioned the lobbying efforts of a foreign nation. So what did she say? And how are those comments being twisted? Let's give it a reality check you won't get anywhere else. Quote, I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says it's okay for people to push for allegiance to a foreign country. I want to ask, why is it okay for me to talk about the influence of the NRA or fossil fuel industries or big pharma and not talk about a powerful lobbying group that is influencing policy? End quote. That was the statement made just a few days ago by Minnesota Congresswoman Ihan Omar. Only 60 days ago, Omar became the first Somali woman ever elected to Congress. And since then, she's been attacked, frankly, on various fronts, including for being a Muslim. But it has been her comments about the unquestioning, unwavering support of the nation of Israel and its policies that have brought the most heat. Now, because of that statement that I just read to you, about questioning lawmakers' allegiance to a foreign country, House Democrats are now pushing a resolution against anti-Semitism. According to Politico, the draft measure is four pages that largely details the history and recent rise of anti-Semitism in the U.S., but does not specifically name Omar, which had been an internal dispute among Democrats. Instead, it condemns the, quote, myth of dual loyalty, using the same language as top Democrats like House Appropriations Chairwoman Nita Lowry, who have condemned Omar in recent days. And it is the claim of dual loyalty that's drawing so many of these attacks. For instance, the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, wrote this, quote, Accusing Jews of having allegiance to a foreign government has long been a vile anti-Semitic slur that has been used to harass, marginalize, and persecute the Jewish people for centuries. 
Sometimes referred to as the dual loyalty charge, it alleges that Jews should be suspected of being disloyal neighbors or citizens because their true allegiance is to their co-religionists around the world and to a secret and immoral Jewish agenda." End quote. Well, that historical perspective is certainly true, but reality check here. Representative Omar did not accuse Jews of having an allegiance to Israel. She questioned the motivation of lawmakers who are not Jewish from both sides of the political aisle, who have unquestioned support, not of Jews, but of the nation and government of Israel. And there is a very big difference between those two things. Again, to be crystal clear, Congresswoman Omar says that she is questioning the U.S. relationship with Israel and the influence game in Washington, specifically in the form of lobbying from AIPAC. Case in point, just this last week, UN Human Rights Council released a report stating that Israel intentionally shot children and journalists in Gaza. Every Friday since March of 2018, Palestinian protesters, they have rallied near the Gaza border to protest the Israeli blockade. And every Friday, Israel shoots a large number of people. The investigation ruled that there are reasonable grounds to believe that Israel violated international law. The report found that Israeli forces, get this, have killed 183 Palestinians, almost all of them with live ammunition. The dead include 35 children. 23,000 people were injured, including over 6,000 shot by live ammunition. Again, the commission found 35 children have been killed, some from direct weapons fire. The commission also noted one case involving a disabled person in a wheelchair and direct fire at journalists who claimed that they were clearly identified as press. One commission member, Sarah Hussein, responded that there was no justification for firing at children and the disabled, whom she claimed posed no danger. The commission also took note of injury to Israeli soldiers in those confrontations. So why does it matter to get this story right? Well, that's because while the UN did release that report on Thursday, it has not been covered by one single mainstream media outlet in the United States. It has not been commented on by even one lawmaker. And the evidence of what Congresswoman Omar is talking about is right there. Instead of putting together a resolution against the killing of 35 children during protests along the border and thousands of others who were injured, Rather than even debating it, House Democrats are drafting a resolution in order to attempt to silence a legitimate criticism, not of people, not of a religion, but of a foreign government. Now, any thinking person can separate those two things, but when we do not, well, that is exactly the core of this problem. That's a reality check. Let's talk about it right now on social media while we still can. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I have done everything I could. I've searched high and low for someone who understands that modern day Israel are not Semitic. The only person I found that understood that is Helen Thomas. And she was on the Joy Behar show. Sorry, it's not visual, but I will give you uh, the links to all these, you know, because I, I got them off of YouTube videos. <laughs> I, I, I will give you these uh, links so you can look them up. And I really don't like the idea of promoting Joy Behar, but the fact is, Helen Thomas understood the truth. Very few very few people know the truth. So, let's go listen. The Joy Behar Show, every night, 10 Eastern, on HLN. The downside of being outspoken is sometimes you get in trouble. I can relate because I've gotten into trouble over my career also. Uh, Congratulations. You know, yes, and it's, thank you. I mean, you know, when you have a big mouth, you're going to get in trouble. And my mother used to say, good luck with your mouth. But that's called freedom. It's called freedom of speech, and I use it every but, day. And you pay the price. You pay the price. Okay, and you did pay the price. Okay, so <laughs> like those Israel remarks that you made, and I want people to see what it is we're talking about. So let's watch. Any comments on Israel? We're arresting everybody today. Any comments Tell them on to Israel? get the hell out of Palestine. Ooh. <laughs> Any better comments? <laughs> Remember, these people are occupied, and it's their land, not German, it's not Poland. So where should they go? What should they do? They go home. Where's the home? Poland. 
so the Jews, Germany. The Jews go back to Poland and Germany. And, and America and everywhere else. So when you look at that, when I watched that and when I saw it in the first place, <clears throat> I thought to myself that that is an insensitive remark that Poland and Germany are the exact places that the Jews were put into concentration camps and that at the very, very we least... We fought World War II. I had two brothers, many yeah, relatives. Right. There hasn't been the persecution since that, since World War II. You don't take other people's land. But so, so, but do you see the insensitivity of the remark that... No, I, them, I didn't realize it would ring that many mm -hmm. bells because they've been free ever since. I know, but Germany and Poland, you didn't pick, you didn't pick, you know, Alaska, you picked Germany I and Poland. I should have said Russia, too. Well, Russia had its, uh, its share of anti-Semitic pogroms also, but... They you, also had 25 million who died in World War II. That's true. But I'm trying to... More than that. Yeah, so, I mean, Germany, Poland, you know, Dachau, Auschwitz, we're talking and about... And the United States. Mm -hmm. And the United States, what? I said they were, he said, where should they go? Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have to go anywhere, really, because they weren't being persecuted anymore, but they were taking other people's land. The, you're talking about the Israelis? Of course. Uh -huh. uh, do you consider yourself anti-Semitic? Hell no. You do not? I'm a Semite. You're a Semite yourself? Of Arab background. Oh, I know, you're Lebanese background, mm -hmm. right? But you're not Jewish. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, no, you say you're... I'm just trying to clarify. They're not Semites. I mean, most of them are from Europe. Mm -hmm. The Jews? Yes. Well, okay, but I'm trying to see. If you had a chance to redo the comment, what would you say now? Why do they have to go anywhere? They're not being persecuted anywhere. The Israelis? Mm-hmm. Okay. Why do the, they have the to Jews, go anywhere? The Jews. Well, the are... question was, any comments on Israel? That's what the question was. And you said, tell them to get the hell out of Palestine. Right. And then the it's, rabbi who was interviewing you said, um, any better comments? And you said, remember, these people are occupied and it's their land, not Germany's, not Poland. So where should they go, he said. What should they do? And you said, why go home. they have to go anywhere? <clears throat> they aren't being persecuted. They don't have the right to take other people's land under international law. Mm -hmm. Occupied land should not be annexed. But then maybe you should have said, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but maybe you should have said, well, they really, the Israelis should stay in Israel. That you, but you said they should go back to Poland and Germany. That's what got you in trouble, Helen. He, no, he said, where should they go? Yeah. Well, I, maybe it did get me in trouble. Everything is distorted, but oh. I don't care, you know. You don't care at this at, point. No, at hell no. Okay. All right. Well, you got a lot of criticism for it. How did you deal with all of that criticism? We have Organized lobbyists in favor of Israel. You can't open your mouth. I can call the President of the United States anything in the book, but if you say one thing about Israel and you are off limits. Well, that's what happened to you. I mean, yeah. the Society of Professional Journalists retired the Helen Thomas Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm -hmm. They said no individual worthy of such honor should have to face this controversy. No honoree should have to decide if the possible backlash is worth being recognized for his or her contribution to journalism. Are you offended by that? By what? The fact that they will not give this, um, this award to anybody in your name? Well, I mean, that's their decision, but I think it's stupid. It has nothing to do with my views about Israel. Mm -hmm. My achievements in journalism are a little separate. Mm -hmm. So you have no regrets about what you said, even though they... You... I have regrets that everybody's misinterpreted it uh -huh. and distorted it. And you have the Ari Flesher and Abe Foxman distorting everything. So I should have, I certainly knew that, and I should have kept my mouth shut, probably. So, but you, okay, so but you still don't feel that it was insensitive in any way? No. No. I'm, in, I'm sensitive about the Palestinians being pushed around, knocked on the door at 3 o'clock in the morning, get out of this house in 24 hours, three generations in, in refugee camps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pushed from their homes. I see. But you see the other side of it. The other side of it is that the Jews are sensitive because of the history that they have well, in the 20th century. Well, everybody's sensitive when they're being pushed out of their homes. Well, but the 20th century was particularly cruel to the Jewish population. Yes, it was. In, and Europe, I, in when, Germany when My and family went through World War II. I, we were very sensitive. All of us were there. Every American was there. <clears throat> but did your family go to a concentration camp? No. 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 Well, that's the difference. That's the point. 
The difference is that count how many thousands of Palestinians are in jail now, thrown from their homes, a million refugees. Mm -hmm. Is that sensitive? <laughs> Everybody's got sensitivity points here. Right, you're Isn't right. Well, there you have it. You have a little something from just about every side. And I am on the side of Helen Thomas and Representative Omar in this issue. I'm far from a liberal, but I do believe in truth. Now, let me explain this. Well, I don't know if I explained it here. I know I've explained anti-Semitism elsewhere, so I'm going to do it here. All right. What is a Semite? A Semite, Noah, had three sons. Ham, Japheth, and Shem. And these three sons are responsible for the entire population of the world. And Israel, the original Israel, were Semites. Why? Because Abraham was of the lineage of Shem, and therefore so are his children. Now he had two sons. Isaac, the promised child, and Ishmael. Ishmael, now keep in mind, biblically speaking, bloodlines go with the father. That's why when you go back into the Old Testament, this man begat that person, this man begat that person, this man, you know, we have all, we, you never hear the mother's name saying, and Rebecca re, uh, begat so-and-so. You don't see the women's names. Lineage goes, bloodlines and lineage go with the fathers. Now, not every uh, not every uh, society or not every country ever uh, followed that uh, that logic, but Israel certainly did. Okay. So, the original Israel, the Israel that God established through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, that Israel was, was Semite. But, the whole thing came crashing down in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. That ended Judaism. And, and it scattered the people everywhere. So, I mean, those, those who survived, because a lot of the Semitical Jews or Judeans, were murdered. They were killed by the Roman armies in that war that went from 73, uh, from 66 to 73, somewhere in that neighborhood, 67 to 73. Okay, it was, it was a seven-year war, and, of course, now, there were some people, there were still some Semitical Jews that, were left in the land and how they ever survived I don't know but eventually I think it was in the uh, 135 AD was that is that the correct 134 135 AD Rome finally crushed them so the nation of Israel the nation of Judea gone for all history now if you do a little research you will find that the bloodlines of modern-day Israel do not go back to Shem. And therefore, they are not Semites. Okay? So, to, to say, if you say something bad about Israel that it's anti-Semite, no, it's not. Now, let me tell you something. 
what is anti-Semitical is the way people are treating Palestine. And about the only person that seemed to understand that is Helen Thomas. Anyway. So folks, isn't it time to get it right? I mean, go look at history. Go look at biblical history. And you will find that modern day Israel are not Semitic. And that seems to be the basis of what the problems are today. Thinking that Israel is Semitic. They're not. They're imposters. And they don't belong in that land. So, since Helen Thomas said it, I guess I can say it too. <laughs> anyway, so ladies and gentlemen, now you have an idea of what is going on in truth. You, you, got, you got these people from all walks of life saying one thing or another. Very few people are telling the truth. Except myself. And Helen Thomas told the truth in that clip. Folks, isn't it time to do the right thing? And by the way, you know, Representative Omar is absolutely right. We do have a Congress. We have Congress people like Chuck Schumer who is paid off by Israel and what about other Congress people that are paid off by Israel it seems like there's a lot of Democrats because this this resolution that they passed condemning anti-Semitism if that is not pro-Israel what is these people will go, will do away with freedom of speech when it comes to Israel. This is what they're trying to do. So, anyway, that's the truth, folks. That is the truth. And isn't it about time you believe the truth instead of all the lies you've been told all these years? Anyway. Okay, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry if this has taken a long time. <laughs> but it's an important issue. It has to do with our governance. It has to do with the Constitution. It has to do with our country's... Uh, it, it has to do with everything. And the, the only reason that the media is saying the things that they say, for the most part, the only reason they are saying it is because they are bought off too. All right? So we have a bought off government. Oh, we have the president. President Donald Trump is probably the most pro Israel president we've had in a long time. Probably since Lyndon B. Johnson, who basically supported Israel in their attack of the United States of the USS Liberty. Okay? So, if you don't think Israel has influence on our country, quite frankly, you're blind. They've attacked the USS Liberty, and our government did nothing. They've killed Rachel Corey, and our government did nothing. They did 9-11, and our government lied about Islam doing it. They've committed espionage. I mean, these people are not allies. I mean, with friends like that, we don't need enemies. Go look it up, folks. Go look up what happened to the USS Liberty. Go look up what happened to Rachel Corey. Go look up what happened to... Um, Go, go look up about 
And go look up the name Jonathan Pollard so you can talk, see about the espionage Israel did against us. These people are not allies. Or at least they should be. Anyway. Okay. That's my commentary for today. Sorry it had to take so long. But this is a very important issue. Thank you for listening.